Hi, could we uh, have everyone settle down, please, before we begin? Hi. So, I am um, extremely privileged to host this panel, and uh, it doesn't need an explanation. Uh, these are formidable, redoubtable women, and midnight's women <laughs> at that. Uh, and, you know, before I give a formal introduction, uh, this session is called Midnight's Women because they're all born in 1947. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's very rare to get three esteemed panelists who are doyens in their own field uh, to, and also born at a very critical time in India's history. So, uh, Without much ado, I will start with Laila. Laila Taibji, again, needs no introduction. She's the founder member and chairperson of Daskar, a body which is dedicated to promoting and sustaining handicraft and handloom. And uh, she really doesn't like being called a revivalist because it focuses too much on the past. But Daskar has also been credited with reviving uh, a lot of very rare handloom and, and handicraft. So, and she's an activist. Uh, so welcome, Laila. Yeah. And uh, Chitrita Banerjee, uh, our next panelist, is uh, as impressive. She's a culinary historian. She lives in uh, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts, but has, a f has her feet firmly, firmly planted on this side of the world as well. And uh, she has a very interesting mix of US, India, and Bangladesh in her life. Uh, she also has penned a biography of uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's interesting, and his food habits. I wish you talk about that a little also. And uh, so a completely different perspective. And uh, Subhashini Ali. <laughs> Uh, as you know, I mean, everyone knows her. She's a firebrand politician, uh, a member and a Politburo member of the CPIM. She was also uh, a member of parliament from Kanpur, where incidentally I visited her many years back when I was in Kanpur myself as a journalist. And uh, of course, her parents are Captain Lakshmi Sehgal and Prem Sehgal. Uh, you know. Uh, who they are. I'm obviously not going to say who they are, you know. So, uh, so three very, very distinctive voices and I would say distinct perspectives. So we'll start by saying, asking uh, Laila, as to what influenced your life choices, particularly what you do, and whether that time had anything to do with what you chose to be and chose to do in your life. We'll start with that. I think it's very difficult to have been born in 1947 and not being influenced by both the freedom movement and what happened afterwards. Uh, many members of my family were involved in the freedom struggle, and were close associates of Gandhiji. And then there was my father who was in the Indian civil service and was then seconded to the Indian Foreign Service and started many of our missions abroad. So even growing up as a little girl, one felt one was in a way representing India because the flag that was hoisted at the uh, Belgian embassy uh, soon after I was born by my father was the first Indian flag to be flown in Belgium. And, of course, my parents had a share in the national emblem and the Indian flag design. Uh, and growing up in many, many countries, I think you see your own country more clearly than when you're in the midst of it. So we saw the things that made India different and made India great. Uh, it was a time of great idealism and formation of many of the institutions that we now take for granted. And every time we came back to India, we saw India growing, 
we saw it developing. And uh, I think it's inevitable that when I came back to India eventually, I wanted to do something that was very Indian. I can't say I planned my career because I never did. I always have operated on a take what comes each day. But I think as a design person, I was automatically drawn to Indian techniques, Indian motives, Indian people. And I loved working with craftspeople. And that's, I think, what took me from initially thinking I was going to be an artist to eventually becoming a craftswoman. OK. Um, Chitri Tati, um, culinary history is fairly interesting. In fact, very interesting. So, uh, and, uh, so would you like to tell us a little more about how you came into it? And uh, I would like to also know about the biography. And of course, how the Times decided your choice, if it did. Um, one of the things uh, I sort of was thinking when Lila was speaking about her experience is uh, that during our um, childhood and school and college days, we were all, you know, most of the people I knew, my friend, we were a very hopeful bunch. You know, we were very con conscious that we were born into an independent country. And we had a very hopeful idea of the future, even though India at that time was, you know, struggling with many, many problems, uh, certainly economic problems. Um, regarding choices, um, I am probably a feckless character who <laughs> just does not plan things well. Um, you know, I was a student. I went abroad to Harvard to study. And at that point, I was thinking I would be an academic. I got bored with the idea, so I quit. And then I sort of worked as an editor, as a translator for a while, until I was approached to write a book about the history of food in Bengal. That was happenstance, you can say that. And once I accepted the proposal, I found myself really uh, learning about my region. I wouldn't say all of India, I would say Bengal in a very, you know, extensive and extraordinary way. You know, food became a prism through which I could see our history, I could see our society, the effect of our religions and rituals on the daily lives of people. So, you know, food became a kind of secondary teacher for me. And I decided that, you know, this is something I would love to continue doing. Um, so, you know, I've been doing that off and on. My, I've been doing this for 30 years now. My first book came out in 1991, so you can see uh, <laughs> how long I've been at it. But in the middle, as you say, um, I did write a book about uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And one of the things that kind of intersected with, with my food work and writing that book was that, um, and this is one of the reasons why I just, you know, find Chaitanya so fascinating, uh, that here was a religious reformer, and you normally expect characters like that to be very ascetic, to be very um, austere, and to be very, you know, detached from the pleasures of life. But all these sort of biographies about him that existed, you know, the 16th century story biographies about him, they contained detailed descriptions of food. And I found that quite fascinating. You know, here was this man who was invited by his devotees to come and to their houses and to eat. And these biographers were people who actually knew him. You know, they, they were also his young disciples. They were writing the books in old age. And they proceeded to, you know, put down in infinite detail, you know, numbers and numbers of dishes that were cooked and served to Chaitanya and that he really enjoyed and the ones that were particularly, you know, favorites of his. And I said, you know, this... Was vegetarian dishes also? No. He was a Vaishnav, so he was a vegetarian. And, and this is also something that I'm happy to uh, stress. Bengalis are not just, you know, people who eat fish. You know, we have a very extensive cuisine of being vegetarian food and it is not often realized. But, you know, but that was just a small aspect of, you know, Chaitanya's life, I agree. But it was something that, you know, dovetailed with my, you know, food writing and my culinary history work. And it was a great discovery again. So I would just say, you know, my life, uh, looking back, the choices have not been made very consciously. They were more me taking opportunities that came my way. 
But I've been fortunate that each of those opportunities led me to very wonderful discoveries. That's wonderful. Uh, before we go to Subhashini, I want to share an anecdote uh, which really tells you how she, how she is. Uh, so I was a rookie journalist. This is like early 90s. And I just got married and moved to Kanpur. And frankly, I thought that was the end of the world for me. But anyway, I got a job with a local paper and uh, Pioneer. And the editor took a look at me and said, go and talk to Subhashini. Uh, do an article on her. You will like it. So I said, OK. So we go to her house in Civil Lines, a beautiful house, and beautiful carpets all around. Uh, and then, and I was very interested in them, and she painstakingly described each carpet, you know, how it was. And it was a nice yellow sandstone floor, and the carpets were vivid and glowing, and the beautifully done house. Uh, and her mother was there, which was a bonus. So we were talking, uh, and, uh, and she was telling me many interesting things about herself, her choices. And uh, just the day before, there was a dharna in, in I think, the Lohia factory which I went and attended just because I wanted to see her in action. And then uh, we come back uh, to the house, uh, I mean, to the interview, of course, and then the one letter comes. And uh, so she, uh, it was a courier or hand-delivered letter, so she tears, it up, tears the envelope and says, school se chitti hai, fees mein bharti hoon. That's about her son's school. And chitti muzaffar ke naam. <laughs> so, uh, it's addressed to him. And she pays the fees, and she stays in Kanpur, and, uh, but the, the letter was in his name. So, I mean, we had a good discussion, and I, I remember that even 30 years later. <laughs> so, so this is what, uh, I mean, Subhashini is like, for you all you know. And uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, so what I would like to ask you is that, um, obviously, you're a very well-known politician and daughter of celebrated parents. So how did, did that, was your life choice an automatic one? Or uh, how did you come to that? And did the times influence you? See, I would just like to remind everyone that we are all very privileged people. I don't know so much about you, I know about Lila and myself. We are children of, children of privilege. And we were very, very fortunate. We were born in an independent country just as it became independent with parents who were playing an important kind of a role. And we could go to the whatever were the best schools at that time, eat well and all the rest of it, and also be given a lot of freedom. So this is all the result of privilege. It's not something that we were great people or, you know, it's something intrinsic to us. We were lucky. Very, very lucky. You meet other people who were born in 1947, they'll have something very different to tell you. So I think that's something that we should always be conscious of. Now, our growing up, as I told you, it was, you know, we were of liberal parents. And so sometimes I wonder, and this is a question I have, is it right to be brought up the way we were brought up or is it wrong? We were brought up told that religion is not important. We were brought up not knowing anything about caste. So is that the right way to bring up people in India? I sometimes think that it isn't. I mean, I'm very happy that I had atheistic parents. I'm also very happy that I had parents who themselves didn't, I mean, tried as far as possible not to observe caste distinctions. But I think it also kept me very far away from the reality of Indian life, from the reality of people in our country and what they suffer and what they go through. So I think that's something that one should always remember when talking about one's own background, one's own growing up, that it was all wonderful. I wonder, was it wonderful? Were we living in a bubble? And therefore, it's very difficult to accept, even more difficult to accept what's going on now. Because we were so unaware of all these forces which are very much in our society. Very much. It's not something that's coming from outside. Everything that's happening is coming from within our society and from a lot of the oppression that people have suffered and a lot of discrimination that people have suffered is coming out in different ways. So I always wonder, is that the right way to bring up your kids? I think it's better that you bring them up not to be casteist, not to be communal, but also to be aware much more of realities. The only thing that I knew about my parents, I mean, this freedom fighter business was all much later that I 
came to understand what they had done. But I remember that as a child, I knew one very interesting thing about my parents. People used to come and ask, what were you doing on 15th of August, 1947? And you know, the answer would be, we were celebrating, we were on the streets, we were saying, chanda ucha rahe hamara and all of this. And my parents, I heard them say, and I was shocked, I thought these are very anti-national people. Because they said, we were, in, we were not celebrating, we were in deep mourning. They were the two most celebrated freedom fighters in this city. They were invited to every function on the 14th, on the 15th, on the 16th. But they did not attend any of those functions. Because they said we were in deep mourning. Our country was being vivisected. Our dearest friends were being turned into foreigners and strangers. This was not the freedom that we had fought for. It was, came dripping with blood. And so we didn't think there was anything to celebrate. We didn't celebrate. We actually just had a quiet dinner. They did something else with the dinner, which I'm not going to tell you. You might get shocked. Because we've just been hearing, you know, vegetarianism and all these things. But anyway, so they also did something else to cheer themselves up a bit. Didn't work. But they didn't celebrate. And many, many years later, I was told that there was one other very celebrated Indian who didn't celebrate the 15th of August. And his name was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And I must say that I really appreciated my parents after that. So anyway, we grew up privileged. And uh, can I just say something about Laila and myself, yeah, if you don't mind? I, I, of course. I you want to that. come to that later? Or can uh, just say? No, no, of course. This is very important. See, both of us went to a school called Wellam Girls School, which is a very established kind of school where everybody wants to send their children now. Nobody wanted to at that time except crazy parents like hers and mine. So it was started by an English woman called Miss Linnell in Dehradun, and I was among the first 10 students. It was completely crazy, and I wish there were more schools like that. Laila came there later, I think more because her mother was, had been her student, Miss Linnell's student in Hyderabad. But I think that um, my parents influenced, you know, it's very difficult to be influenced by your parents because you're just, criticizing them all the time. You're finding lots of things wrong with them all the time. So that must have been through osmosis and much later when you get to appreciate them. But I think Ms. Linnell was, I would say, a seminal influence on both of us. She was just somebody incredible. First of all, she forever destroyed for me that there was anything great about being physically beautiful. Because she was not, can I say, but she was so tremendously intelligent. She had such a great mind. She had the most amazing sense of humor. She was introduced us to the world of literature, to romantic literature. She was not prudish. She would read poems to us that I think today would be banned in classrooms, etc., etc. And so this whole thing about you know physical beauty or glamour, all this just didn't play a part in our growing up, and I'm very thankful to that. And Miss Linnell was somebody who always kept dinning into our heads. You know, your mothers, your grandmothers were not allowed to go to school. They couldn't study. They couldn't read. They had to fight every inch of the way. You've got it all on a platter. Don't waste this education. Do something. Whatever you think is worth doing, but do something. I think that was very important. Yeah. This is actually brings us to a very important question. That uh, today, uh, on one hand, we have millennials, uh, Gen Z, uh, Instagram influencers, um, and uh, Facebook groups and communities, and they're all, all great, I mean, in a, in a way. But we also have tremendous bigot bigotry, even amongst young people. More and more younger people are sporting their religion as like a badge of honor, and, and many more, and there's greater divide. And uh, though I'm not uh, a midnight woman, uh, we grew up, I grew up here in this city, this is my home city, and we had an upbringing pretty similar where we didn't know about caste. We, we only, my parents are, I mean, parents of that generation only cared about education and there was no gender discrimination. And we were told that your, your academic grades are your only passport, use them to do what you want essentially. Uh, at least I grew up like that. So I find this very dichotomous 
that on one hand, we, we seem to be advancing in the digital era. And on, one, on the other hand, uh, there seems to be regression. And, and so this is an important question. And this, I think, somebody asked the Nobel laureate Abhijit Banerjee the same thing. And she, he said that when I read in economics in presidency, I thought that was the world. Uh, you know, homogeneous Bengali middle class. And uh, when I went to JNU for my master's, I first realized caste exists. And it's a very important element of our society, what you are saying. Uh, so this is a question to you, a broader question. Uh, maybe Lala again, you can start. Is that she, Subhashini is asking a very fundamental question and I'm echoing it. What do you think is happening today? What is a good way of telling young people what is important? I mean, should we say the way we grew up is the right thing? Or should we actually, as she's saying, recognize social realities and how they impact our culture, our identity? Uh, so what's the right way? Well, that's a real toughie. And uh, I very often, uh, as a single woman, now feel that one of the many good things that happened as about being single was that I didn't have to bring up my children and take these choices of how do you bring them up? Do you make them streetwise thugs or do you make them sensitive, caring people? And, you know, I think this is a dilemma. Living in India, growing up in India is tough. And how do you prepare your children for that? But I want to go back that, yes, in many ways, the sort of the 50s and 60s were in some ways a time of struggle and survival in India, but also of idealism, but there were other strands. And one of the stories that, I mean, that was part of my growing up, and which people forget now when they join into bands and say, well, you know, all the Muslims were supposed to go to partition, I mean, to go to Pakistan and look at what happened to the Hindus coming back and all the slaughters, forgetting that slaughter went both ways. But I think people forget about a very big chunk of Indians, of whom my family, my extended family were part, the ones who deliberately chose to stay on in India. For my parents and for my aunts and uncles and for my grandparents on both sides and everybody, going to Pakistan was inconceivable. They thought the idea of a single religion country absolutely claustrophobic. They thought, like Subhashini's parents, that partition was one of the biggest losses at a time when India should have been celebrating. We were losing something which was the spirit of India. So I think we forget that. I mean, I remember my father telling me uh, that uh, for him, it wasn't a choice. He automatically stayed on in India. He was in the ICS and he was in the Constituent Assembly and he stayed on in India. But even his colleagues in the ministry didn't quite understand and actually almost resented the fact that here is this, you know, this country was created for you. It tore India apart. Why are you still hanging on here, you know? But there were millions of Muslims who took that choice and who stayed here. And nobody really talks about that. And uh, it's something that one constantly has to argue about and uh, say that, well, you know, I'm very proud. And in some ways, I'm doubly Indian because I was born an Indian and I chose, my family chose to remain Indian. Uh, so I think that all these things, there are very many subtleties, there are many things and to look at India in this majoritarian way is really a tragedy and I'm very lucky that I work in a field where craftspeople of every caste, every religion, every gender, every region work together and for me the Daskar Bazaar is a microcosm of what India should be and I think the, the color, the joy, the friendships, the collaborations that happen because of that, the difference that becomes a partnership is actually a module for what we should be following. Great. Yeah. 
Uh, my perspective, of course, is somewhat different. Um, as Subhashini was saying, the two of them were born in very privileged families. I was not. Mine was a very sturdy middle-class family. And like you, my parents said, you know, that education was the only thing to focus on because that would be the only thing that would lift us up. Um, one of the things that uh, I noticed later on, however, was that even though this was a very traditional Bengali Hindu Brahmin family, uh, we were not very overtly or consciously um, anti-Muslim. And uh, that is one of the things that I noticed in some other families which used to puzzle me. And here I have to bring in my personal experience as to illustrate what I'm trying to say. Uh, I happened to marry a person from Bangladesh who was a Muslim. So you can imagine the <laughs> reaction that provoked among many people, uh, including my family, who ended up accepting him with affection. But the point is that this also was tied to a major historical event in the history of the subcontinent, which is the Bangladesh War, 1971. And uh, I happened to be stuck in Kolkata during that time, and I saw what was going on. And um, actually, uh, Suhashini's mother was a wonderful person who organized a lot of relief and help for the refugees who were you know, coming across the border in West Bengal. And that's something that I've never forgotten. Um, but the thing is that that was one time when I found that many, Bangladesh, many Bengali, West Bengali families in Kolkata whom I would have expected to be not helpful, to not care that these people were sort of suffering because of the choice they made to sort of be in Pakistan and now they were having to suffer for it. They did not act like that. There was a common humanity that rose up at that point and they wanted to help as much as possible uh, all these refugees who were coming in by donating food, by helping out doing some other work, joining NGOs. And for a while, you know, that made me feel that, yes, India has these very uh, conflicting forces in its uh, society, but we can rise above it, you know, when the circumstances are like that. And later on, I also found that you know, some of the very strange happenings were correlated in history. For instance, you know, in 1975, I happened to be visiting India, uh, Kolkata, when emergency was declared. And we all felt my family was crushed. Now, how can this be? This was a country we were so proud of. And how can that be happening here? I went back to Dhaka after my holiday. And two months later, on, the, on August 15th, 1975, Sheikh Mujib was assassinated. And once again, a lot of people there were saying the same thing. How could this be, you know? This is the person who motivated us to gain our independence from Pakistan. And we went through so much suffering. And then we are undoing it. So I think, you know, history often shows us that, you know, we do and we undo. And what you're seeing now that you're talking about, you know, young people sort of being very, very bigoted and holding on to their religious beliefs and their religious uh, groupings very ardently and uh, therefore, you know, uh, leading to a lot of conflict and hatred between groups. That is something that uh, is very depressing. I mean, I can't tell you how depressing it is for people like us when we remember our hopeful and idealistic childhood. But I am still hoping that this will again be undone. I am a great believer in the doing and the undoing. So, but I don't know how it will be undone. That is the thing. But I live outside, so it's hard for me to, you know, prescribe things. I'm just an observer. Truly, I mean, in, in, in that spirit, I would say, I mean, if I were to grow up again, I would grow up exactly the way I grew up. I mean, I'll make that choice because I don't think it will alter my, my world view, uh, a, a, a sort of acknowledgement of caste or gender or class. Uh, but that's a personal opinion, of course. Subhashini. Uh, it is, it's basically, uh, you know, what we were asking, that there's such conflicting forces now within our society. So what is the best way of uh, inculcating in young people? I mean, should they be 
uh, actually brought up in a more pragmatic way where what is happening, you tell them about that. Uh, you know, caste is important or, or at least it's a force to be reckoned with, uh, a class identity or a gender identity, or you would grow up the way you grew up. Well, as far as I'm concerned, what is my problem with the way I've grown up? You know, it's a wonderful growing up that I had. Things have not gotten worse, they've gotten better. But that's really not the point. It's not about Laila and Chitra yeah, and you and myself. Not, yeah. It's about the country we're living in and the society we're living in. So I don't think that's, that we can decide how people are going to be brought up. Or that. But I think that what is very important is to keep talking, to keep conversations going. And not to be talking in an echo chamber. It's very nice for me and Laila to be talking to each other because we agree on most things. But it's very important to be talking to people who don't agree with us who don't think the way we do, who think in a completely different manner, but where is it coming from? Why are they believing like this? Why are they behaving like this? I think that if we do not try to understand this, things are just not going to get any better. And about caste, okay, not knowing about caste. See, we didn't need to know about it because obviously we belong to privileged castes also, whether Hindus or Muslims or whatever. That's, don't, we should not forget these things. That perspective of saying, oh, in my house there was no caste, that's because there didn't need to be. Yes. So that's very important to acknowledge and accept. So therefore, I feel that many of us, and all of us here, I think, who are sitting in this session, are really extremely frightened and very concerned about what's happening. We are very worried about, you know, things getting worse or whatever you're, you're saying. That's going to happen, but then they'll get better, but we don't know. We're 75 now. Will we be around when they get better? I want to see them getting better. But the point is, what is the effort we are making to make them better? I think that's the real question. It's not enough to keep talking to people like ourselves. We've got to talk to everyone. We've got to talk to people. And I've had a very interesting experience here where, you know, I was, I come from a political stream which was not you know, forward block or Netaji and all of this. But I came to know Netaji, appreciate and respect Netaji through reading, through finding out things. And I think that what is very important, and you don't have to go out there and shout slogans or whatever, but you have to tell people how important the idea of secularism was to people who were really great leaders. And that it's not uh, something that they just adopted because they thought that would bring them votes or whatever. Nowadays, we are being told that secularism is just something to get you votes. No, secularism is absolutely essential to keep India together, to keep India together and keep India moving forward. So I think that is something, and very unfortunately, people like us, PLU, are also betraying this real understanding and talking arrant nonsense. And that's really disturbing because these are all people like us who've benefited from having a secular democratic constitution. And now we want to uh, betray it. We have a singer who's a Bharat Ratna who refused to sing a song in praise of Dr. Ambedkar. So these are things that we have to question. Why? What is the motivation? Where does that come from? It's a very deep-rooted, casteist kind of, you know, intolerance and hatred. So what I'm saying is one problem, I think that, and I share that problem. Because of the way we grew up, we do not try to understand how other people grew up and what other people are thinking, what is motivating other people. And that's absolutely essential. I do not believe that the majority of this country are bigoted. I really do not. Though I come from a state where I should probably believe it, but even in that state, I don't believe it. But the point is, are we really making an effort to speak to people who think differently from us? I think probably we are not. Laila is doing much of that because she's working with people who understand you know, if you're a weaver, you understand that tana bana se hi kaam chalta hai. Tana hoga aur bana nahi hoga, to kuch nahi, kapda nahi banega. 
So she's working with people who understand the importance of this. And believe me, most poor people in our country also realize that people cannot do without each other. People have to live in cooperation. They may not love each other. You don't have to love each other. I don't love many people. But you have to live in collaboration and cooperation. So I don't want to preach, but I do want to say that yes, we are disturbed, we are unhappy, we are angry, but also we are very much responsible for these monsters developing in our country. We've allowed them to develop. We've allowed them to get to where they are because we are the privileged generation we are the privileged section of society that should have been out there much more stopping this from happening, speaking out against it, talking to people, having conversations from, with people who don't agree with us. And I think that if we talk about the freedom movement, that is where that generation differed from us. They left their homes, they left their comfortable lives, they left their comfortable existences, and they went out there, they got beaten, they got thrown into jail, but they were with people, so people had faith in them. Why should people have faith in you and me? So there are many things that I think about, many things that I think we have to change in the way we think and the way we behave. Because whatever is happening today, you can say they're responsible, yes, but somehow we're also responsible. And to accept that responsibility means you want to get out there and change what's happening. It has got to change. If India, if our country, if our society is to have a future, this has to change. There's just no two ways about it. It's no use thinking, I've got a home somewhere else. I can go there. This is where we are, and this is where we have to make the change. So please, if we can start doing that, talk to everybody you come in contact with and tell them that really what's happening is not in anybody's interest. You have to talk about interest because interest is what actually changes people's minds eventually. Thank you. So you heard, I mean, we all believe that we have to listen, we have to talk to different people, we have to cohabit, uh, collaborate, uh, in and, and create harmony because that's the only way. Uh, but this has become, this is a serious discussion, but it's become very serious. I want to end on a ve slightly lighter note and, uh, and then open it up for questions. We have some time, not a lot of time. So in 60 seconds, Lana, if we were born today with all these privileges mm. and, and the, the world at your fingertips uh, on the small screen, what would you be? I think I would be in I would be a mother and I would marry all my children to intercast and I would also tell them that cookery, if we didn't have multiple communities, where would we have wonderful Indian food? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Big hand to that. <laughs> Jiti Tadi. Oh, one of my uh, secret ambitions has always been to um, be a designer. And I never saw a way, I never found a way to, you know, do that when I was uh, a young person. And uh, again, the weight of expectation that I would have to be in the world of reading and writing, if not teaching, always, you know, uh, controlled me. I could never get out of that. But today, you know, you can learn so many things with the touch of his screen, and uh, you can reach people, and you can make a community, and I would try to find my way into one of those, and work with them, and design beautiful things, whether it is fabrics, or objects, or pottery, or whatever. It is something, not that, nothing I've ever done before. Big hand to that as well. You have to move to India then. <laughs> so, Bashini, uh, we do well, have I'm just a one very minute. boring person. I think if I was born again, I would like to do exactly what I've done. And you know, I had a strange mother. I think she has a world, she was a world record for many things, but something that is not known. She joined the CPIM when she was 57 years old. Now, you know, people are told that you are a communist when you're 20, and if you have any brains, you're not one when you're 45. Well, she obviously hadn't, I don't know whether lack of brains or too much heart, but anyway, she joined the CPIM when she was 57. 
So I think that if I was to be born again, if they would have me, I would do exactly what I did and I would join the CPIM or whichever Communist Party was doing something good. Great. Uh, we have a time for a few questions. Just keep them short and introduce yourself. Josh, yeah, a mic to her, please. Would you also uh, tell us who the question is for? The question is for all of you, actually, okay. uh, um, uh, on the panel, all, all the Midnight's women. Um, can you hear me? Am I audible? I wanted to ask you, given these incredible views, these incredibly liberating and positive views, why you are not out there in the digital space speaking to the next generation, because this is so inspiring and so needed. Uh, please, please, please leverage technology in whichever way you can to, to you know, have you considered it? Would you consider it, please? Lila well, does, I think I yeah. used the digital space extensively, but I, I think people read what they want to read. And I'm going to just tell you an anecdote. I was at Gauhati Airport some years ago, and a young girl came running up to me, and she said she was very modishly dressed and very charming. And she said, oh, I admire you so much, and I follow you on Facebook, and I read all your things. But you know, I love those posts that you do with saris, but I wish you didn't talk about politics, because then that's so heavy. <laughs> so I was just trying to explain to her that you need to have a rounded view of the world. When another young girl came up, much more earnest and with glasses. It's them. They're so beautiful. Um, anybody else wants to take that? Yeah, well, I started speaking when I was two years old. And I don't think I've stopped since. I probably speak in my sleep also. So you can't accuse me of not talking. But the problem is, it's very difficult to reach today because the media is in the state it's in, etc., etc., etc. But I agree with you, yes, we have to keep talking and hope that someone listens. People do also. Hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, this is Abhishek Roy. Uh, uh, this is great to see all of you here. Uh, I, question, uh, I thought that it would be a misfit question, but you already have been discussing this uh, in the last uh, phase, is that uh, all of you had a very privileged background because your parents took part in the freedom movement, uh, and then you were born in a new India, a new republic and all. But do you feel that, because uh, I also come from a family where my grandfather was a freedom fighter, and I've seen my parents' generation, it's their, your generation, that they have been in certain ways very detached from please, their parents. Please ask the question, uh, because we have very limited time. Yeah, please ask very, the question. Uh, they're very detached from the ideology which they actually bore, in the sense is that, as Vashiniji was saying, that you know, uh, because uh, they fought for the country and they, they built up a secular, a democratic India and all. So you, uh, your generation somehow got the privilege, but somehow were divorced from the ideology and I the other, other aspects. that's a very arrogant thing to say without knowing. Yeah, yeah. yes. I'm sorry, I feel that that's a remark that you are making without knowing very much about us. So I would ask you yeah. to read that, a little That's about an assumption. Let's uh, take one from the back. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, wanted to get your views on, uh, you know, the point that you made that even with all the technological advances, uh, with the great connect that we have with the rest of the world, there's a lot of divide in India. There's a lot of bigotry in the new um, generation. Uh, I feel that somewhere the root cause of all of it is the skewed dissemination of information that we have, right? Whether you talk about the freedom struggles that, that we all read about in classes, in, in, in our uh, syllabus, um, a lot of information is missing. A lot of information is very specifically engineered to a certain narrative. It's all very telecentric. It's all very What um, is the selective. question? I mean, I'm, please, I'm imploring everyone. Okay, Keep the question, the question is, do you feel yeah. that disconnect? The reality that you've lived and the things that we study, do you feel that there is a certain disparity and that could be causing a divide? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, there is social disparity. We spoke about that. And we also spoke about the ways that we can collaborate and work together. And that's the way forward. But I, if anyone wants to take that. 
I can just say, don't try learning about the freedom struggle from people who had nothing to do with it. That's all I can say, because I have to give you a very short answer. Uh, this gentleman in blue had a, had a question. Yeah. A question, please. Huh? हेलो मैं 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 हिंदी में पूछ रहा हूँ मैंने मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है क्या हम सपना देख सकते हैं कि भारत में भी ऐसा दिन आएगा जब ना कोई कास्ट और रिलीजन डिफरेंसेस होगा जैसे आपने कहा था मुझसे पूछ रहा है सबसे नहीं नहीं आप नहीं देखिए सपना अगर हम नहीं देखेंगे तो जिएंगे कैसे और ये सपना ही देखना चाहिए कि एक ऐसा देश होगा जिसमें असमानता नहीं रहेगी जिसमें हर तरह की असमानता खत्म हो जाएगी लेकिन इसके लिए सिर्फ सपना देखना काफी नहीं है आज जो लोग हमारे देश पर राज कर रहे हैं वो बुनियादी रूप से असमानता को ही सही मानते हैं वो संविधान को सही नहीं मानते हैं वो असमानता को ही सही मानते हैं तो उनसे लड़ना भी पड़ेगा और अपना सपना भी देखना होगा और सपने को साकार करने के लिए लड़ना भी होगा Two more, yeah. This gentleman uh, in green, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm again another one, 1947 born. But unlike you, uh, I grew in a very ordinary middle class family and lived in a very small town. Now, my question, what I found in those days in my small town where I lived, the essential issue was, I mean, nobody really bothered about secularism. I had a friend, Sabuddin, he was a son of a tailor. He used to walk 10 miles to come to the school, so on and so forth. But the real problem, all these people have this, how to grow, how to earn a living. And but somewhere in the middle, this secularism and the bigotry, they have, uh, they have taken over the main struggle, What's which is the question? life for What's your question? My question is, one has to look into it why this, the bigotry kind of issues which you are talking about, that has overpowered the struggle for existence, which was the main struggle the, the time I knew. The problem was not secularism, the problem was probably capitalism. <laughs> okay, we have this lady in front. Uh, we will take very quickly these three and end, okay? Uh, very quickly, short questions. So uh, I'm Priya and again liberal minded parents so I do not understand caste. Uh, Suhasini ji said talk to people but the person who is talking the most to people especially young people in institutions uh, it's a broadcast and everybody is mandated to listen to that. After that when I go to class uh, to teach and if there is and when there are pieces related to freedom, it's like, uh, it's a very, very violent atmosphere, very difficult to address because less than 18 year olds have been brainwashed in the institutional setting. How do I deal with that? Lala, will you, will you do that and then maybe you can come? Well, I think that everyone has to have the courage to speak out against the single voice bombardment. I think it's because people today feel very inhibited that they might get into trouble, and of course many of them do. But I think we have to overcome that, and there have to be multiple points of view. I don't think either Subhashini or I are saying that, you know, there is only one way of looking at the new India. But people need to hear that, the different points of view, the different experiences, and to then make up their minds, rather than being led like lemmings by this single leadership voice. So all of us have to have the courage to tell our stories, to tell our point of view. And if trouble comes along with it, we have to face it. Uh, the gentleman in blue and then this lady in green and we'll end. Okay, all right, I will come. Hello. Uh, yeah. This question, Ma'am Dipankar Sen, this is from Mrs. Subhashini Ali. You, we spoke so well yesterday evening. I have one question. If you could throw a little more light about this. 
uh, religious tolerance that can you, you speak like have, this that you that you must have learned from uh, or experienced from your mother and who in turn must have uh, got it from netaji also plus my uh, one question i have is uh, you are you joined the cpm but we all learned that they were sort of anti netaji if you have anything to throw on that see i don't know whether that's uh, first of all i don't want to talk about my mother and netaji and all that that's not what we are talking about today we can have another session about joining the cpim and netaji yes it's a fact nobody will deny it the communists were extremely critical of netaji having gone to germany and met hitler and then collaborating with the japanese there's not, that's a part of history that's a fact but also they were mistaken in their characterization of netaji and i think the great thing was that they accepted this and they accepted it publicly you had a chief minister called jyoti basu and he said publicly that there is no way that you can uh, doubt netaji's patriotism and his uh, devotion to the struggle for freedom so that being having been said i joined the party before that but yes they were critical there's no doubt about it and i think that some of their criticisms were unfounded some were perhaps better founded but that's the thing you'll have to say about many things and certainly my mother joining is even more surprising than me but she joined after she had this discussion with jyoti babu and he made this statement so there are a lot of changes that people have made honestly that should be appreciated okay one this question here amarunthati yeah. rai the mic is my mic okay can you hear me now yeah okay my name is arunthati rai and uh, one of the young persons sitting behind me had asked a very relevant question what message do you have for young people now i find that uh, before i come to my quick question a lot of political overtones in today's uh, discussion amongst everybody both on stage and off stage i would like to know would you advise the value of compassion because i raised this it has come to me suddenly lady on my right who is 94 years old and most people know her ruby pal choudhury now she wanted a cup of water but three people consistently denied her water till such time my friend on my right besides rubidi went over there fetched her a cup of water these are very important values and i think no amount of politics of any party will fetch us any dividends in the end it's the kind of human being and the heart that you have developed in yourself That's thank you true. yeah it's very true it's very unfortunate if, if that has happened that's the last question please so i am vibha mitra and i'm sorry but I'll, i have to make a statement to stress on what i'm going to say and the question i want to ask it's about little children i have to make a statement to ask my question so i mean uh, i educate kids and i have encountered small kids who are very bigoted four and five and they've heard dinner conversations and passing fleeting things and they make funny opinions they don't want to share their tiffin with other people it's a rampant problem in schools teachers are in denial i don't know about other states but in calcutta yes i teach uh, test prep so general knowledge is a very important part you'll be surprised that uh, nobody knows who wrote the national anthem 98% of the times it's a wrong answer they give gandhi i always put it and laugh and tell everyone that let's see how many get it right uh, learning is so mechanical they have learning is so mechanical no, no, what is the, what's the question the question the is question? that how can we bring this change at the education level those children give what answer to what question national anthem for general knowledge uh, about 90% of the children write gandhi and it's a joke when i set the papers i said let's see how many will get it right this time so what, what so is the question how can we adopt i mean you can't help the family because in a school i learned discipline and a lot of my values in the system how can we adopt you know proper nationalistic ideals and teach them the proper sense of nationalism in schools i think that's a very very important thing we cannot depend on families i mean if i may say something the idea of nationalism itself is very different for different people right now 
So, uh, you know, we can't uh, really have a uniform standard of nationalism imposed as well. Uh, it really depends on what you think, what your context is, etc. Having said that, of course, I mean, we are all Indians and uh, we love our country and we would like to see it prosper. But I honestly feel that if you have a, a very uh, unilateral view of nationalism, uh, that is probably not a very good idea. And if you go back to Rovindranath, as I mean, we are Bengalis from this city. And Listen, he, he doesn't belong to uh, just you, huh? Uh, it belongs to everyone. It belongs a little more to us. <laughs> so, and uh, but you will know that how I mean how he warns against this whole unilateral nationalism Jingles. and it's which can have it its real flip side if anybody wants to we are over our time but if anybody I, I want just to want to appreciate i two teachers who have spoken i am really moved by what they said it's not something that i've got anything to tell them it is awful very, what very they have sad. to hmm. yeah i mean it's really and i know i go to nana actually she had That, that most is, people don't. Yeah. So well, uh, at yeah. least they know. At least they know the name of Gandhi. I mean, that's that's something to say. But I think that the whole thing. I mean, to go back, I don't think that any of us were preaching any ideology. We were just talking about how important it is to recognize that the greatness of India is diversity, and that without that diversity, we wouldn't have an India. So that is what when people thump their chests and say, I'm proud to be an Indian, which has become rather popular, they need to recognize that they have to be proud about every aspect. The other thing I think I should say to all of you who, is that of course we must preach compassion and tolerance, but that doesn't mean being tolerant of intolerance, and we have to speak out against it. Tell the last word from you. <laughs> well, the last word is inspired by the story this uh, lady told us just now about being denied water. And uh, one, of the, one of my favorite stories about uh, Shaitanya is, you know, he, in that day and age, you know, which was a very conservative time, he made a point of not making, you know, any kind of distinctions in caste in how he treated people. In those days, untouchability was, you know, very, very strong and obvious. And he was the son of a Brahmin, and people expected him to live by those rules. He had no problems in ignoring that. He had uh, one of his favorite disciples was a Muslim guy, um, and he really sort of shared food and water with him. So I would like to remind people more and more, especially Bengali people, because Chaitanya is a Bengali hero, that you know this is a model that exists, a model of you know compassion and acceptance and inclusiveness. And if we can you know sort of follow these ideals a little bit by remembering these great people that existed in our past, we might be able to. Uh, somehow overcome a little degree of the divisiveness. I'm not saying, you know, it's very easy or that everything can be overcome in one day, in one step, but maybe a little bit by remembering some of the past instances of people who were very brave and who did that. Um, so, you know, it's not like it has to be something that we have to invent. The way of being a compassionate and inclusive person exists, exists in our history. And what we have to do is to look at that history and take inspiration from it. Okay, so we are completely out of time. And uh, uh, a at, at big thank you to uh, just, just, yeah, I mean, but just let me thank the panelists once and also the audience for being such an engaged audience. And uh, this, this happens in Kolkata at every, every time I come, which is so wonderful. And thanks to our absolutely esteemed panelists for the discussion uh, that we had. And uh, with that, and thanks KLM for making that possible. Thank you. And you, you were saying something. Yes, what were you saying? Yeah, yeah.